it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Stuart Carter from the University of um, Liverpool. And uh, Stuart is going to talk about um, sort of no novel approaches to, uh, to, to, to vaccination, what's called uh, reverse vaccination technology. Uh, and I think we're all looking forward for a very interesting uh, keynote talk here. Thank you very much, Stuart. OK. I hope you can all hear me. <coughs> Thank you, Eamon. Um, I'd like to start off with an apology. I'd like to apologise for my government and its cronies for trying to attempt to screw up international science and for making, and for making a mess of things. Um, I did not vote to exit. I wanted to... Shut up, Roger. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, really, it's really good to see such an international sort of gathering here um, uh, it's a sign that we can all work together no matter what our governments all choose to do. So it's great. I mean, I, couldn't, you know, I, look, I look on the board and I see so many. There's, a, there's about 40 people here from Poland. Anyone here from Poland? Everybody put up their hands. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Romania. There's 19 people from Romania. Anyone here from Romania? Oh, well, Buna Dimineadza anyway. Right. So the science I'm going to talk about is hopefully internationally applicable. What I'm going to be doing is talking about uh, digital dermatitis. So um, there are several issues that I'm going, to, I'm going to deal with over the course of this talk. One is about what you do know, which I'll do briefly because you know it, and then the stuff that's new to you, which is the em emerging issues, why we need a vaccine, and the fact that we now have tools available to actually make a vaccine, and why, we, why it might work. So those are the three sort of issues I'm going to try and cover. So the first problem, you're, but presumably you're in this room because you know exactly what this is. So we're talking about bovine digital dermatitis, lesion at the back of the feet of dairy cows, a major problem. Sorry, I can only point at one screen at a time, otherwise I'll blind Eamon. Yeah. Um, it's a major cost internationally, and as far as farmers are concerned, it's, it's second only, really, to mastitis in terms of its importance. And there are no really effective treatments. There are treatments, but there are no really effective ones. And one of the reasons that, that, that what, what we can do and what we do do and what we try to do is not particularly effective is because of the cyclical nature of, of this disease. So we start off, you probably can't read, but we start off with uninfected animals you get a, an active lesion, and then, it, and then it starts to heal. But then it can recur again. And this is the, this thing all of the practitioners will see, that you can do something about it, it will get better, and then it can easily come back again. And that is, that is, that is the big challenge of this disease. Um, these uh, various parts of the cycle have been classified into different numbers, and uh, I think they're well recognised as being accurate. It's going to sound a bit like an undergraduate lecture. I'm, I'm going to just briefly mention the history of this because the history is relevant in terms of time scale and the fact that we're still talking about emergence and we are still talking about emergence. And that's what I'm going to be dealing with in the first part of the talk today. So there's, uh, Mor there's Mortolaro. It was first called Mortolaro's foot. Um, first described in Italy in 74, the USA in 80. And then there's Roger, who's in the audience there, first described it in the UK in 87. So that was obviously spreading quite quickly. But now in, 2000, in 2016, what we're talking about is something that's seen worldwide. All countries with dairy cattle can report this. Different uh, amounts of prevalence, incidence, but it's there. So one of the questions I've always been wondering is, well, what, what might or could happen next? So let's get on to the pathogenesis, and that's, and, that, and that's where the issues start to come. So it's patently an infectious disease. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Absolutely no viruses have been implicated, and there have been many people who have looked for them. And it is, appears quite obvious that bacteria have a considerable role to play in the pathogenesis of this disease. But obviously, which, which ones? The ones that have been identified by virtually all, all, all those who have had a look are what we call spirochetes. These are kind of bacteria. And they're, they're called spirochetes because they have a spiral twisting motion. And, they look, and you can see from the shape of them that they are like a screw. 
They're highly motile, and I think that's part of the pathogenesis issue. There are a whole load of different spirochetes. There's the ones that cause Borrelia, that are called Borrelia, which cause Lyme disease in dogs and cats and uh, those two-legged things, uh, humans. Then there's Leptospira, and then there's Treponema. The most well-known ones are those cause syphilis in humans, and they cause uh, periodontal disease in man as well, and yours. Previously, not much was known about treponema in, uh, in cattle until, until us and a few others started looking. And the bottom line is, is this, and that's basically, if you get a BDD lesion, you will find spirochetes guaranteed. You will see them, you'll detect them by whatever t ever tool you use, immunohistochemistry, molecular detection by PCR, whatever, you will always find them. And you don't see them on normal, on normal feet and normal skin. They are, they are totally associated. That doesn't mean they're the only cause, or, or that doesn't mean they're any cause, but they are totally associated. Now, they're quite difficult things to try and study, these treponemes. They're very difficult to purify from the lesions because, as you can imagine, there's lots and lots of other bacteria in those lesions. And they're difficult to grow in the laboratory. They're anaerobic. So until we started playing, playing around with them, there weren't many isolated. But we've been very success, successful. We used a little, a little trick that we got from uh, general microbiology using magnetic beads coated with antitreponeme antibodies. And here we are, here's magnetic beads. We've got anti-treponeme antibodies on them. We mush up a lesion and, the, and mix them with the beads and, the, and we can literally then just pull the treponemes out of, 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 the, of the mush with a magnet. It is, it is that simple. And then we can grow them by selective medium. So as a result, we've been very successful. Um, and the, the treponeme World Cup score so far is Liverpool Vet School 120, rest of the world 22. That's not to criticise the rest of the world, it's just we probably put a lot of effort into it. So we've got a lot of isolates to play with. And I don't expect to see any detail here. We've done classification by phenotype and genotype and, character, and lots and lots of characteristics. So, so what we're saying is these are all, these ones up here and here, with, they've got T numbers on them, it doesn't matter. And these are some other human ones down here primarily. They, they break down into three types that we can grow. So we can grow these things, and when we, when we study them, they appear to fall into three distinct groups. Group one, two, and three. And they're different phylotypes, and in fact, we've actually na we named one a couple of years ago as a new species, uh, T. pedis. Pedis seemed a reasonable name for it. So those, those, that, that's what we can grow, so that's what we can study. So what can we do about them in terms of the animals and disease? Well, obviously, biosecurity must be an issue when you're talking about an infectious disease. So you keep your farms clean, keep out DD cattle, you know, because cattle move around from farm to farm. Disinfect where, you know, wherever possible. Then, of course, if you do get the problem, you can try foot baths of one kind or another, or antibiotics, or you might even want to consider a vaccine. And those are, the, those are the little devils we're trying to sort out there. Antibiotics. Yes, you can use antibiotics. And I'll, I'll explain why they don't work in a moment. There's a whole range you can use. There's a whole load of testing you can do. There are issues with antibiotics, inevitably, in terms of the effects on the environment, the effects on human and animal health. And we've developed assays for, for, to see which antibiotics might be effective. And the ones that are the most effective, penicillin and macrolides, are the ones you can't use in milk in cows because you have to have milk withhold. There are newer versions, which you might want to use, but they're not allowed in foot, they're not allowed, they can't be used in foot baths because of resistance risk and transfer of resistance to humans. So there's all kinds of issues coming along. Now, other antibiotics, the tetracyclines have some efficacy in treating the disease, but not in, control, not in really controlling it. And the reason that they have some efficacy is that they will attack and control the other bacterial populations which are involved. And I'll explain how I think that works. 
but they don't touch the treponemes at all. So how do they, so what's the working hypothesis here about how treponemes actually cause disease? Well, first of all, treponemes invade feet. Now, they may invade feet for a number of reasons. There may be micro lesions. There may be other reasons, which I'll come on to. But they penetrate deeply and initiate a lesion. Then, because we all know what cows are standing in, most of the t a lot of the time, other bacteria will come along from slurry and invade and inflame and cause a full-blown lesion. Now, when the animals are turned out to grass, the lesions are often less severe or less common, and then the clinical disease is rarer then. I think that's because your secondary infections aren't so, aren't so, aren't, aren't so uh, close by to the skin. So, the antibiotic agents that are routinely used to counter the disease have a short-lasting effect because they attack the secondary infections, not the primary treponeme infections. Thus, the disease recurs. So that's one problem. I used, I used the word at the beginning, emergence. We're talking about emerging diseases. I am talking about emerging diseases. So, as if, it, as if that wasn't bad enough, we've now got another problem. And my colleague Joe... Uh, Joe Angel was talking about the epidemiology of this disease yesterday. In the UK, the disease has spread into sheep. 1997, it was first reported. In, in recent years, it's been spreading very quickly and is virtually endemic in the British Isles now. And there was a report of it in Chile last year, and you hear rumours of New Zealand, but nothing, there's nothing published yet. You can see here the lesions at the front of the foot front of the hoof. It's a different presentation. And as Joe explained yesterday, it's a much more severe disease than in cattle. You get complete uh, shell loss here. And that's down to bone. And what we found, just to cut a long story short, is we found exactly the same three groups of treponemes that we culture from <coughs> cattle. We found those in what we call COD, contagious ovine digital dermatitis. We found exactly the same organisms. For many years, people said the disease is also in beef cattle, but no one had ever written it up, so we, we did it. We've written it up. Exactly the same lesions again. It's a, made the cover of that record. And the same treponemes are found in the lesions. The same organisms are present. And now, new presentations in dairy cattle. Coronary band lesions, similar to what we see in sheep. Increasingly seen in the UK, so Roger tells me, can be very severe. This is still another manifestation. And then, a year and a half ago, we found the disease in goats in, uh, nor in northern England, a place called Lancashire. And all cases are very severe. Look at these feet. Aren't they just awful? That's the bottom of the feet. They're just awful. Many of these goats had to be culled. It was just too severe. There was nothing you could do. And this was not a dirty goat farm. It was a very clean goat farm. And again, we found the same organisms that we detected in cattle. So you can see... Either it's emerging or we've been very slow to pick this up in previous years. But I, I think it's emerging. What else is there? Well, someone reported they thought they saw DD lesions in elk in Washington State. So they sent us some samples. We were able to grow treponemes. We were able to identify them. And they're the same ones as found in DD lesions. And that's in elk in the USA. There's some anecdotal reports of lesions in UK farm deer, but we, I can't substantiate that. That's only a rumour at the moment. And we're also obviously thinking about the role of other wildlife species, either as reservoirs or in terms of them actually having disease. Does it get any worse? Has anything else happened? that well, no one's noticed. Can, is it possible that these treponemes can be associated with other problems? 
new problems, old problems. There are lots of foot lesions in animals, well-known ones, things like toe necrosis, white lion disease, sole ulcers, well-known, frequently described as non-infectious. We've shown that there are now severe forms of these, which are very, very difficult to treat. They're obviously infected, and we tested them a few years ago, and we found exactly the same treponemes were getting into these lesions and changing the nature of these lesions. So instead of being non-infectious, they then became susceptible to infections and had different manifestations and actually were very, very difficult to treat. I can remember being at a cattle lameness meeting in, in Nottingham a few years ago in which they had a, a number of journalists there from the uh, farming press reporting on this. And they put up some pictures of these diseases and it actually showed someone using a Black & Decker to try, a drill to try and clean them out. And two of the journalists just fainted either side of me. So that's another manifestation. Anything else? Could there be anything else? Yes. Now, it'd be interesting to know if any of you have seen this. It's called ischemic teat necrosis. So it's not ulcerative mammary dermatitis, it's teat necrosis. And you see that on the left-hand side, you can see this inflamed area. This is, this is obviously very, very painful for the cow. And they lick it and they suck it, and eventually it gets so bad they chew it off. Anyone seen this? Yes. Thank you. And in early lactation. Yeah. So there's a problem. First reported again by Roger in the UK in 2004, now rapidly spreading. And what do you think I'm going to say? The same, the same organisms, all three phyla groups are present in these, in these lesions. So... This is stuff we've just... I'm telling you all this stuff because it's, it's all stuff we published in the, within the last few months. So that's, that's just published. <coughs> so we've, we've got a new postgraduate working on that. Other cattle skin lesions, pressure sores, hock lesions. I wouldn't say they're caused by treponemes, but the same bugs are present in these lesions. Again, stuff we've published in the last few months. Pigs. Pigs will often have skin lesions. They're often called vice lesions because they bite each other, because they're aggressive. But why are they biting each other's ears? Is it because they're more tasty? It's a well-known fact that some wounds are actually attractive to animals to lick and to suck, to try and clean. Well, we found that in these flank, ear and tail lesions, we found the same organisms again. And finally, and this is not work that we've done at Liverpool, this is done in, uh, I think, Denmark, they've been found, the same uh, treponemes have been found in equine canker, which is a sort of homologue of digital dermatitis. So how, how do the treponemes transmit? What's the infection reservoir? Do they go from the backside of a cow to its own foot, to the foot of another cow? Do they go, are they transmitted to another farm? Are insects involved? And how does it get from cattle, how has it got from cattle to sheep? And what's happened to, and, and where did the goat come into all of this? There's a whole load of things that we need to attempt to understand. This, this is a slide, I, don't, I haven't got a lot of data today. This is called immunohistochemistry, in which we can de specifically detect the treponemes, and they stain up red or brown. And this is a low-power magnification of DD skin. You can see these brown, uh, reddy brown areas here. Those, ladies and gentlemen, are hair follicles on the feet of a DD cow. You think the skin on the foot is pretty tough, isn't it? 
It can get lesions, but hair follicles were a weak link. Now, if we go down to higher power, here, you can see them bright red, and you can see them coming out of the hair follicle in between the cells. And then later on in disease, they spread throughout the dermis. So I would, I would propose that's a, route transmit, that's a route of transmission via the hair follicles. Not the only one, but it's one. Can these things be found in the GI tract? Yes. Not all the time, because it's difficult to work on. But we can find them in the rectal anal junction and mouth of some DD cattle. And someone, not us, has managed to grow an isolate for faeces. How does it get from one cow to another on the farm, i.e. in housing, in the barn? How does it get from foot to foot? Can it swim from foot to foot because they're close together? Probably. They're highly motile. They're highly motile. But can they survive in faeces? Well, we've done some mini experiments. There's, I think you recognise that stuff. Those are the uh, treponemes. We co-culture and then we look at survival. Not rocket science. Pretty basic science. And they can survive at, at 12 degrees at least for one day. We're doing further studies on this at different temperatures and under different conditions. So that would be long, but the bottom line is one day is definitely long enough to transmit from one foot to another foot. So we're talking about a widespread and emerging problem. Biosecurity is obviously going to be important. We know that cows can take digital dermatitis onto farms. What else, what else could transmit DD? Other animals, sheep, dogs, close farms, vehicles, the fact that animals go to markets, and they mix there. Could farmers be the problem? Could vets be the problem? Foot trimmers. So we've looked at one of these so far, and that's foot trimmers, though some of those are vets, of course. There's a foot trimmer at work. And there's another foot trimmer at work. You may recognise this character. He sat over there. Foot trimming involves doing lots of things with a hoof. It involves lots of tools. You're trimming, making it all very nice. Even in include power tools. So why might that be relevant? Well, in 1999, there was a paper saying that DD is more common on farms after foot trimmers have been visiting. So the question that was raised was why? And I wondered if... The foot trimmers might be involved here accidentally. So, the question was, can DD treponemes be transmitted on foot trimming tools? So imagine you've got a, uh, a cow with a lesion, you're trimming the foot, you then go and trim a foot of a normal cow, are you going to actually give that cow the disease? Are you going to transmit it on your equipment? So the approach was we swabbed the blades of knives immediately after foot trimming before and after dipping blades in antiseptic. And then we tested them by trying to grow them or by molecular techniques. And the bottom line is yes. We regularly, regularly detect DD trepidemes on all foot trimming tools. And we've even detected them after disinfection. And we can grow them as well. They're also found on the power tools, the gloves, and the crushes used by trimmers. Now we're moving on. So that's, a, that's obviously a risk factor that needs to be taken into concern. Because we've got this big archive, this big bank of bacteria, we've been able to do some fancy uh, molecular genotyping called MLST. It's a way of classifying them in relation to each other. And what we've done is we've classified them according to and we've, uh, we've been looking at all the different species, and the bottom line from all of this is, is that whenever we look at any one particular clade or type of organism, we find them in virtually all the species we've been looking at. That's the bottom line from that. The same organisms are found in virtually all lesions and animal species. So... Are the same treponemes transmitting disease between species? Almost certainly yes. We've published a couple of papers on this, and the stuff that we just published a few weeks ago on the genotyping totally confirms all of that. 
So the answer is yes and yes, as far as we're concerned. Now, I don't want to start any rumours here. How closely are these related to human treponeme infections? Well, we took one particular group, group, group 2 treponemes, and we looked at the MLST data. You can do an awful lot with this kind of data. And we were able to show the relationship between all the different isolates that we'd got and those that we had from humans as well. And the bottom line was, was that these were the animal traps here and those were the human ones there, thankfully. We can all be happy now. At least temporarily. So you can see, you can see they cluster quite differently. So with, there's no zoonotic evidence at all. So what do I think is the role of treponemes? You can think what you like. What do I think is the role of treponemes? I'm stood on here, so I, it's my chance to speak. So what do I think is happening? I think that in, in, in cattle and in sheep, the strong evidence, not total evidence, the strong evidence that they're the primary cause uh, 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 of the actual uh, DD lesions. In the other diseases I've subsequently discussed, all the other skin lesions, all the other foot lesions, I'm fairly convinced that these organisms, these treponemes, these three different groups of treponemes, are actually secondary invaders. They're opportunistic infections. Bacteria are clever like this. We, uh, we have a half-life of about 40 years, if we're lucky. Bacteria have a half-life of minutes. They're, they're going to evolve. They just do it. Antimicrobial resistance, etc., etc. So I think they're probably secondary to other, to, to other causes. So why are we seeing all these? This is just a hypothesis of mine. The farmers, the farms and the animals have been fairly constant. They haven't changed much over the last 40 years since this disease was first reported. Have the treponemes evolved? Well, yes. They've always been considered to be anaerobic. Anaerobic means they don't like oxygen. They'll be killed by oxygen. Well, we accidentally left them out of the incubator over the weekend and they survived. So I would say that's not true. And we know that in sheep and goats, we can often see these organisms, not just deep, but we can actually see them on the surface of the skin, which would suggest they can survive in oxygen. So if they become aerotolerant, they're going to transmit much, much more easily. So we'd, we've got a, that's, a, that's a, a current research angle that we have going on, looking at this, to see if that could be a target for therapy. So, these organisms are implicated in many foot and skin lesions. They're spreading. They're not controlled by antibiotics. There's resistance issues, obviously. Not killed by foot baths. The diseases recur, and foot bath contents can be banned. So there's key targets for intervention. So what interventions are you going to do? Hygiene is obviously always going to be important. The toxic foot baths are going out. The antibiotics are going out. So a vaccine looks like it could be a very good option. So, the current control mechanisms, etc., are pretty ineffective and potentially dangerous. We've been able to grow these bugs, say we've got 120 isolates, and we've done some genome sequencing of all, of all the relative gr groups. That is ideal for making a vaccine, and would have multiple applications. If we can make a vaccine, that would be, re that would be relevant across the range of things I've been describing. Now, at this point, there's a whole load of things that come into play. The relationship between animal science and industry. Oh, it's usually been pretty good. So, who's the monkey on the right? That's a venture capitalist. They're people who have lots of money who want to make even more. So they invest in things to make more money. So in 2005, I spoke to some venture capitalists. That's only 11 years ago. And I said, would you like to be involved in developing some new vaccines on, for farm animals? No chance. There's no, there's, no, there's no money in vaccines. They were not interested, not even slightly. They laughed at me, in fact. Swines. But in 2016, in fact, earlier than that, 2013, the world has changed. We have antimicrobial drug resistance. There are no new antibiotics coming through. We're in the post-genome era, which means we have genomes to provide new tools. 
There's the Bill Gates effect. Don't negate that. Bill Gates, is, uh, his raison d'etre, having made billions now, is to make vaccines for children, but he's also making vaccines for animals, particularly those for diseases that may transmit to humans. So he's, he's, he's having an effect on the whole philosophy. So pharma the, the pharmaceutical companies are really interested now. And there's lots of pressure because the need to make alternatives to antibiotics. We need to, we need to be moving on. So, what immunity is there in cows with, with DD? What immunity is actually present in the natural disease? The disease is recurring. You, you can get better, and then a few months later, you get the disease, or weeks later, you get the disease again. So cows with current or previous lesions actually have high levels of antibodies. They have very high levels of antibodies to multiple antigens but they are patently not protective. They're just indicative, indicating infection. So how can you make an effective vaccine when you've already got high levels of antibodies? What the hell are you going to do? So your choices are to either boost the immune responses to the antigens that are already seen, try and make a super immune response, or to identify new antigenic targets which the cow, hasn't previ the cow immune system hasn't previously seen. So we, we, we did genome sequencing, we've done genome sequencing, and we found a whole load of side issues uh, relevant to vaccine development. So we've done some human ones. We've got GI tract ones as well for comparison. So they appear to be relatively benign. We've got some human ones as well. The first thing we saw was we could find evidence of gene sequences which have come from other bacteria in there virulence genes from other bacteria, such as Fusobacterium, Dicheelobacter, Clostridium. All of these are deeply unpleasant individual bacteria. And we found the genes from there are inside these treponemes. We've also identified things called bacteriophages. There's one there under high power. They are well known for transmitting genes from one bacteria to another. So we, that's another big angle that we're, we're following up at the moment. So the genome is an ideal starting point for vaccine development. And that's because there's, there's technology around now that enables this. It's called reverse vaccinology. People have been making recombinant proteins for years, but reverse vaccinology is a is, is slightly more recent development. What you, what, what, what? What you do is you use the genome data and bioinformatics to predict surface proteins. You just do it by prediction. Then you use 3D modelling to identify surface molecules which are likely to trigger an immune response. Then you make, you generate recombinants and you trial. And there have been many successes in this. So you're doing it, just to emphasise this, you make it directly from the genome. You don't need any other knowledge of the organism at all. It's all predictive. So you've got the genome, bioinformatics, identify whatever components you think are going to be useful. And then come up with some laboratory validation. That's the other thing. You need to come up with some, uh, some uh, function for these proteins. And then you can get on with doing your testing. So what have we done? So our first analysis pathway, that was looking for surface proteins, found thousands. So we documented all of that. Then we did a second analysis, which was to look at those likely to be immunogenic and reduce that down to hundreds. And we generated genome sequences that are relevant and would react across all of the three phyla groups because we thought that seemed relevant to make a vaccine that would work against all three groups. Then we've used them to generate recombinant proteins in E. coli. And we checked to make sure that they have a natural shape and function about them by refolding them, and we've ended up with 70 of those now. So the thing is, what we want to know is, how do you know which one of these is likely to be any good? Do they have a role? Do any of these proteins that we've been playing with, do they have a role in transmission or pathogenesis? So we've developed bioassays to look for functions. But binding to cow connective tissues, if a bacteria doesn't bind to cow tissue, 
it's unlikely to invade very eff effectively. So that was one of the things we looked at. Then we also wondered if they had enzymatic activity. The way to actually penetrate and do damage is to actually digest whatever you're attaching to. Then you can bore a hole in. So we've been doing tests for that. So looking to see which were likely to be uh, suitable for making a list. And we've got down to, so we've got down to 45. Uh, this is just an example. Um, you won't be able to see any of the detail in this, but what we've got is we've got five proteins and looking at their binding to uh, eight different extracellular matrix proteins. You can see one of them here, number 13, the second one along, actually binds to lots of different matrix proteins. Each of those coloured bars is a different matrix protein. So we can start to identify which of those are likely to interact with the host extracellular matrix, and i.e. potentially more likely to be damaging. Next question. Are the proteins we've made antigenic? And do we want ones that are already antigenic? So what we've been doing is we've been looking, we've been looking at uh, these recombinant proteins and to see if the uh, cow sera from infected animals, from DD animals, actually have antibodies to them. And Because what we want to do is pick those that got high antibodies and those that got low antibodies. Here's one with low antibodies. The other thing we've done is we've checked, uh, we've done uh, testing by, by Western blotting to show we've just got one protein active that we don't get any cross reactions. So we've got a panel now. Oh, so this is, this is, these are cow sera binding to a, a treponine protein. You can see we can get some positives. So what we've done is we've selected a panel of recombinant treponine proteins, some of which already have an immune response and some of which already do not have an immune response. Basically, we're, 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 sort of play, we're, playing, we're playing both sides against each other to try and see which one's likely to be effective. So we're just starting the immunogenicity and efficacy trials in the next uh, week or so. How useful would a vaccine be if it worked? It probably wouldn't work in infected animals, though foot vax does in sheep to some extent. It should reduce and prevent spread of treponeme infections on farm. It would need to be involved with a whole load of other elements, including hygiene and biosecurity. And it's part one of our ongoing projects uh, at the University of Liverpool. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, DD is a continuing major problem. It's rapidly emerging. The bugs that are associated with it are getting into other tissues and causing other problems. It's very difficult to treat. Multiple routes of transmission are likely. I've only talked about one or two. These are serious emerging issues, and there could be more to come. Well, not trying to frighten you, mind, but there could be more to come. So vaccine and biosecurity to reduce, prevent these infections look like our best control approach. So, we're, so as I said, we're about to start trialling the vaccines that, we're, that we've been making. We have a big team of people at Liverpool. There's the lab, there's the lab academics here, postdocs, postgraduate students, lots of clinicians. We work very well as a team. Roger Blow is there. I've been working with Roger for about 15, 20 years on this. He's always been a great stimulator of uh, ideas and many other people. And so fingers crossed that we might get one sometime. And uh, I'd just like to thank you for listening and for the invitation to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart, for a, a fascinating um, insight into the disease, and I'm sure there's going to be questions for the audience, so we have time for some questions. Uh, could you please state your name and affiliation, Sorry and you, sh you should be handed a microphone. Um, so, questions, please. Jennifer McClure with the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation. I uh, was wondering if any of those target va uh, vaccine targets are outer membrane proteins, and if so, have you thought about mosaicing patterns that occur in a lot of these particular bacterial and 
parasitic infections, mosaicing of the outer membrane proteins where they basically take a cassette from one and insert it into the other, which makes it elusive? Uh, yes, uh, they're all outer membrane proteins. Many of them are beta barrels. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're, we're taking that approach as well. But obviously, we've got to, find, we've got to try and fun, find proteins that are cross-reactive against all the different bugs that we're interested in. Thank you. Josh. Um, Josh Aleri, University of Melbourne, Australia. Um, in terms of controlling the risk factors, how effective is biosecurity? It's re it's re it varies from farm to farm. There are some farms which have, are, are very, very good. Um, uh, with their biosecurity measures. There are some closed farms, of course, where they don't import animals. Uh, they're probably the best, but there are others. And there are some model farms. I know some in the UK, I'm sure it's true elsewhere, where biosecurity alone can do it, but it's expensive <laughs> and it's very time, very time consuming and you need a lot of staffing to do it. But yeah, it can be, it can be done with biosecurity alone, don't get me wrong. It's just that particularly under the conditions in some countries, that's not always possible, particularly some of the, the damp climates like we see in in England and Ireland. Uh, John Ellis, University of Saskatchewan. Where, that, are you? Uh, Where are you? I'm back here. Right. Stuart, that was as good and entertaining as I thought it would be. I had just a couple oh questions. Oh dear, was it that bad? No, it was really good. Um, but the causality thing, um, you know, acknowledging the limitations of Cox postulates, can you reproduce this condition with the bug? Um, we've, not we've not tried to. Um, Doughty Dotford's uh, got an infection model at Wisconsin where she's transferred the, uh, the, the, the trep one group of treponemes into feet and, and bandaged them up. And uh, Yarlath uh, Nally, who, is, who may be here today, he, he, was he did an excellent talk yesterday in which he'd done a similar kind of uh, infection model uh, in sheep. Okay. But there he, he didn't use... He, in, in that, on that occasion, he wasn't using pure organisms. He was using a lesion from a cow. So that's not Cox postulates. But uh, yeah, you can, you, can, you can transfer disease with just the, just the organism. Uh, we tend not to do that in the UK because... Um, the Home Office uh, yeah. don't like us doing things like that. And um, with regard to, uh, you know, predictably you might want to discount Th1 responses given the extracellular nature of the pathogen, but with, it's my understanding with, um, you know, the reproductive spirochetes that Th1 responses are important. And so how do you... Well, we we'll try and boost both. We're, we're picking out, we're already, we've got adjuvants picked which will boost Th1 and Th2 responses. So hopefully we'll have those bases covered as well. Thank Thanks. you. Eamon Donnelly, Parklands, uh, in Northern Ireland Veterinary Group. Stuart, there's two questions. One, sometimes we would see lesions in front of the other, mid-line. Is that related to DD? And to, um Sorry, did you say lesions on the udder? Yeah, creating yeah, that, the udder mid lane. I suspect that's ulcerative, ulcerative mammary dermatitis. That's a different disease. We looked at that several years ago, and we did find some of the DD treponemes, but only in some of the lesions, not, not enough to say it's completely associated. We, we have found some there, but only in a, re, in a relatively small number. Right, okay. It's just the, the, sometimes the appearance looks very similar. You know, that's sort of a, a, a sandpaper appearance of DD. It looks very similar, yeah. but uh, that's interesting. The other point is, is there any timeline on the possible vaccine? Have you got any money? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a farm, a large animal vet, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've, got, we've, got, we've got some industrial support, um, and uh, hopefully we'll get some other, other support as the, as the years go by. But I say we're starting, we're starting the immunogenicity trials, and hopefully they'll lead on to efficacy trials soon after that but I might have retired by then. Okay. Jens Böttcher from Bavaria in Germany. Okay. I've got a rather simple question. Yeah. Uh, a rather simple question. Uh, are you able to identify negative herds? Yes, there are herds which don't have the disease. They tend to be closed not, herds. Not the question uh, free of disease, free from tibonema. Um, we can find serologically negative ones, but that's not, not the same. I mean, we, um, I'm not quite sure what you're getting at. You'll find treponemes of one kind or another in every cow, but the, the DD-associated ones, we've only been looking at, at, at farm samples. We haven't been, we've looked at some normal cows, but um, as they're consistently negative, we haven't worried about whether, well, what kind of farm they're from. That's the case. Uh, uh, you are looking for antibodies, but looking and 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 organism by PCR. Yeah. And uh, regarding paratuberculosis, 
coxiolosis. We are detecting a high antibody levels in persistently infected animals, chronically infected animals, which are unable to deal with the pathogen. Yeah. Yes, well, uh, that's exactly what we're seeing here. It's a similar, similar sort of thing, where your immune response is indicative of infection and not, ne not necessarily indicating uh, any protective immunity whatsoever.